Thank you, Bishop. Praise the Lord. Good and gracious morning to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and bless your name. Thank you for who you are, our own Father. Thank you, Lord, because you are a provider. Thank you, Lord, because you are the lover of our souls. And you placed us in life, on earth, in our countries, in the ministry, in the profession. And you want to see us as your children exceed limitations. Lord, we pray it will begin with us here. All those online, everyone connected now, I pray that your grace, your goodness, your power, your glory will flow into every life. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. As you know, we're talking about exceeding limits in our personal lives, exceeding limits in our families, exceeding limits in our profession, exceeding limits in the ministry. And what we're looking at today, the topic is extraordinary limits of the walk and work and wonders of faith. When we walk with the Lord, we want to exceed we want to go beyond those who have gone before us. When we work and labor for the Lord, we want to exceed those who have gone beyond us. We want to, when we experience the wonders of the cross and the wonders of Christ, we want to exceed those who have gone beyond before us in uh, the wonders of the Lord in our lives, in our ministries. Once again, uh, the topic is extraordinary limits of the walk and the work and the wonders of faith. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2, looking at it from verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. He said, it's a new experience. He said, do you remember I was Saul and that time I was contrary to Christ, but now he met me, and I met him. He lives in me, and I live in him. I am crucified with Christ. It began at the time I owned him as my Lord and Savior. And since that time, I wasn't just doing a kind of spasmodic thing down today or tomorrow. Consistently and steadfastly, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet... Not I. There was a time I lived by myself, for myself, and for my glory. But now I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And because he loved me, I love him too. He first loved me, and then I responded to that, and I love him who loved me and gave himself for me. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 1, and reading from verse 3, it says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Faith has work, and it's the work of faith. It says, and your labor of love. Love has labor. The labor of love and the patience, perseverance of hope. You see, those things don't stand in isolation. Faith does not stand in isolation. It works. Somebody says, I believe the Lord. I have faith in the Lord. And we say, show it. But the work of faith. When you have ordinary faith, you have ordinary work. When you have greater faith, you have greater work. And when you have a kind of faith that will not be denied, you have undeniable work that everybody can see. And when you have love, you will have the labor of love. If it's ordinary love, have ordinary labor, but if you have a consuming love 
for Christ and for the people of God and for the creatures of God, you will have also a kind of love that is passionate, burning, that everybody can see. And then there is hope, the patience and perseverance of hope. You have hope, you never give up. You're saying, yes, I believe. Yes, I know. Even against hope, you hope in the Lord and you have that persevering hope. And he it says, it's because of our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God, our Father. Once again, extraordinary limits of the work and the work and the wonders of it. We'll pick them one by one. Number one, we have the exceptional walk into faith exploits with God. Number two is the excelling work of fruitful exploits for God. And number three is the excellent way into the full exploits exploits in God. Look at number one there. Number one, it says we have exceptional faith, exceptional walk into faith exploits with God. Faith exploits with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7, it says for we walk by faith. Not only I, Paul, we walk by faith. The members of the body of Christ, the ministers in the body of Christ, we walk by faith. The proclaimers of the gospel of truth, gospel of salvation, we all walk by faith. And the people who have accepted the calling of God upon our lives, and we go on from place to place and city to city, and we're proclaiming the word we, all of us, we walk by faith faith not by sight what does that mean not by sight look at the wind blowing there look at the cloud looks like it's going to rain today i cannot go out why because you are walking by sight look at the commotion there and look at the routing there and look at what about that place and they say it's a place that is best invested with evil spirit evil power and you want me to go there no not on your life i'm not going there why because you're walking by sight the things you see the things you feel the things you hear the news you read because that's what you are walking by that's why we're not doing the work we ought to do it says for we walk by faith not by sight look at verse 17 verse 17 therefore therefore if we're walking by faith therefore if we know that Christ has died for us and he has given the example and the model of walking by faith therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I've been, you know, reading that for a long time. Actually, when I came to Christ many years ago, I learned this verse. And it says, old things have passed away. All things have become new. I quoted it. I thought I applied it, but now I understand. Old things, old thoughts are passed away. What makes a man's life, a minister's life, the thoughts that he has, is the thoughts we have, and if we still have the old thinking pattern, Nothing is going to change. We come into Christ. We are in Christ. We are believers in Christ, but we carried our old thoughts with thoughts. And sometimes, even in the past, we were thoughtless. And if we carry the thoughtlessness of the past with us, nothing is going to change but old things, old thoughtlessness, all that has passed away. And now it says all things, our thoughtfulness now becomes new. I think in a new pattern. I think with a new vision. And H there, it says all things are passed away. How do you understand that old habits are passed away? You know, our life, our ministry, our profession is based on 
habit. What I did, what I'm doing, what I always do. Look at your habits. If the old habits are still there, whatever the habit is, the habit that did not make you exceptional, extraordinary, those thoughts as are going to make you remain the same person. And the habit that you have that doesn't have any change is the same old habits. But when you have a new heart or a new habit, Things are going to change. You know, as I look at that, old things, I began to see my interest. Because you see, the old interest, when you were very young, you had interest in toys. Those toys might not even have any battery. It may just be the ordinary toy that you have to push, you have to pull, but that was your interest. Now, as we're growing up, as we come to Christ, now we have new interests. It's the interest in your life that drives you. The interest in your life that makes you run like you never ran before. And if we say that the old things are passed away, the old interests are passed away, and now we have a new interest, a new passion, a new drive, something. You wake up in the morning and you want to pursue that. It's the new interest in you know, there are lives that are bogged down by non-essentials. Look at that. Examine that. And you look at what the fellow is uh, sweating on. And you say, my brother, how essential is this to the new life? He says, I didn't think about that. How essential is this to the new ministry, to the calling that you have? Why don't you just go on? And then you bog yourself down and you pin yourself down on non-essentials. Why don't you find out? The new thing now is the needful essential. What do I need as an essential? For this new life I have, and for this new ministry I have, what is the needful essential? And then you get that together, you surround yourself, you fill your heart, you fill your mind with the needful essential. G, the things that were gains unto me. Philippians chapter 3, that's in verse 7. The things that were gained to me now, I counted them as loss for Christ. In verse 8, I count them as dross, as dung. They were gain. The thing, the old gain that you used to have in religion, the old gain that you used to have in, uh, you know, your manner of life, the game of life, you know? If you are playing the same game, the old game that you always played, how are you going to make a further progress? But when it says all the old things that were gained to me, I count as loss. Paul, tell me, what are you looking for now? And what kind of gain do you have now? It says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm looking for something spiritual, something eternal, something up there. That's what makes you a new person because the old is gone and the new has come. The, as the old things pass away, self of the past, the self-centeredness of the past, all that is gone. There is a new thing now, and it's selflessness. You just came from that trip. Are you going again? Yes, I'm going, because I want to have uh, some converts in Rome as well. You've been imprisoned uh, in that place, and that place, if you go again, uh, those people are tougher than uh, the people from where you suffered. He said, yes, it's the selflessness that I'm not thinking about myself. I'm not thinking about what I will suffer. I'm not thinking 
thinking about what I'm going through. I'm thinking about them. They have not heard. They have not known. They have not experienced the power of Christ in them. Because of that, the old selfishness is gone. What can I get from this? That one is gone. What's my gain in this? That one is, what's in it for me? That one is gone. Because the old gain and the thing that used to spur me up and make me to want to run what I will gain, all that is gone. Because selfishness is all gone. What I have now is the selflessness to drive up the good news and the gospel to proclaim it and to get to other people. Now, look at that again. Now, look at that verse. Therefore, if any man, any woman, any minister be in Christ, he is a new creature. Am I a new creature? Can I tell that my thoughts are new? Can I tell that my thoughts are new? Can I tell that my interests are now new? Can I tell that my essential things, whether non-essential or needful essential, can I tell that all those things are true? Can I tell that the game of life and the gain of ministry has now changed new? Can I tell the self Fishness as giving way for selflessness. It says, the old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. I pray by grace you'll be able to say that. Amen. 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 We're looking at uh, three things here. We're looking at number one, the distinct work, work of a God pleasing faith distinct if the faith is going to please god it has to be distinct number two the decisive walk of a great practical faith and then number three is the dynamic walk of guided purposeful faith let's look at number one number one is the distinct walk of a god pleasing faith a god Please see in faith. In Genesis chapter 5, reading from verse 22, and Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. A man, he walked with God, and two cannot walk together except they be agreed. Stand, Lord, I agree. Move, Lord, I agree. Go here, Lord, I agree. No question. No debate, no deliberation. As God spoke every day, every time, in any situation, Enoch always agreed with God. Do you always agree with God? That's what makes our work distinct. It says, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. Ah, there are people that say marriage who make him, disturbs them, distracts them, makes it impossible for them to walk by faith and to please God. Pastor, you understand? I've discovered since I got married, I am not compatible with my wife. Pastor, I'm not compatible with my husband. And my interests are different, her interests are different, his interests are different, and my interests are different. And because of the marriage, that's why I cannot walk with God. Enoch says, marriage did not disturb me. He said, Enoch walked with God. And then he begat me to sailor 300 years and begat sons. And daughters. You know, many people say, I thought when I had the first child, Methuselah, I didn't know what I would do because it affected my devotional time. It affected my ministerial life. It affected all the consecrations I made before as wife came in, as husband came in. I had to lower 
and modify the consecration because you know the woman cannot take all that consecration and walking with God and then the first charge came I had to lower my commitment conviction consecration again you know you understand because now that child has come and you know it's when you want to pray he begins to cry it's when you want to devote yourself to the Lord and it's when you want to plan that you are going to run with the vision and with the passion of a go-getter that's when the need comes there and then begat sons and daughters look at them now sons that means at least two daughters that means at least two with me to sell her that means at least five and you know I almost have a kindergarten school in my home look at all the children and you know they get on my nerves and they affect my emotion you know I used to be cool and gentle and peaceful and I am one of the people that used to say no anger no anxiety and no worry i just walk like that with god but now what can i do with a wife and five children or more than that now and they just tease me and they just topple me and i just get over and i get angry before i even thought what is this but enoch said that they didn't bother me that didn't bother me. It's your thought. It's the way you think. You're thinking of this. You're thinking it's your habit. It's the habit, that thing that had been there before. It's your interest. What interest do you have? Are you having interest only on things or not? It's the non-essentials that happen, that we think about. It's the gain. You know, when I get angry, I have some gain because I can show that woman that I am on top and what I say is what I say and then she sees my anger and my face looks like that of Nebuchadnezzar and I say I'll cast you into that furnace and then she trembles uh -huh. when she trembles for me I feel I am Mr. Somebody there you are Enoch said nothing bothered me nothing changed what i wanted to be and selfishness had gone out totally and because of that we're told families increase responsibilities increase it says i'm still walking with god look at verse 24 in verse 24 it says and enoch walked with god and it was not for god took him for God took him. Why? God said, you're too good for the earth. The whole earth was corrupt. You are the one single identified man and you distinguish yourself. You cannot live here on earth anymore. And he took him. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and I'm reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 by faith. Ah, all that he did, he did by faith. He said, I'll not look at what I see. I'll not allow what I see, what I feel to influence me or to distract my life. It will be by faith. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. He and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation. He had this testimony that he pleased God. Uh, some people say that no matter who you are, and they say no matter how spiritual saved, no matter how sanctified, no matter how filled with the spirit, there must be a but in your life. And many people, they say, I know I'm not perfect because after all, I'm a human being and every human being must have a but in their lives and this happens to be my birth you see the books you read will influence you 
The people you hear will influence you. The people who are defeated by themselves and they're defeated in life, what are they going to write about? They are butts in their lives. They're going to tell you that you too will have a butt in your life. But Enoch said, I don't read their books. I don't sing their songs. All I know is here is God and he wants me to walk with him. And I take one day at a time. A day at a time uh, I please him. And when yesterday is gone and today comes, I say new day, new work, new understanding, new thoughts, and new habits, and new interests, and new needful essential, and new gain, and new selflessness. And because he kept that all the time, every day saw him walking with God. By faith, Enoch walked, was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him God had translated him. Where is Enoch? And the wife said, I've not seen him this morning. Well, go check up in the room and tell him I want to collect my money that he owes me. Not Enoch. Enoch was not a debtor. Enoch was not a promise a breaker. Enoch was not somebody that left something behind that they are saying, but God is faithful, but God is good. How can God take that man away? He owes me this. How can God take that man away? He took our daughter without our consent. He married this and married that, and got involved in this and that, and we now want to get what we need to get from him. How can God do this and take him away? Enoch had nothing. Old baggage that will keep him down. Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony. Where's the testimony coming from? Testimony of God about him. Testimony of the angels about him. Testimony of all men about him. Let's check up our testimonies. Does heaven have that kind of testimony about me? He had the testimony that he pleased God. I'm looking at number two. Number two is the decisive walk. The decisive walk of a great practical faith practical faith. You see, a faith has to be practical. You know, somebody says, I have faith, but you cannot see. Uh -uh. It's practical. I have faith, but you know, it's inside me. And it never comes. In fact, I'm so humble, I don't want anybody to see my faith or to see my love or to see my commitment or to see my consecration. What I want to do, I want to be a private disciple. No, you're not going to please God with that kind of faith which is not practical that other people cannot see. We have the faith that makes us Practical, walkable. We'll walk out that thing. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect. In his generations, compare him with all the other people in the land who are corrupt. Compare him with all the people in the land who are Canal, compare him with all the people in the land who are always contrary to God. They always say no. God is saying this, no. God is asking for this, no. God is demanding this, no. Their no is more frequent than their yes. When last did you say yes to God? When he demanded something you are not thinking about. When he demanded something you, you had never done before, Noah, yes, sir. You'll build an ark. <laughs> never heard of that. I will do. 
And it will be of this dimension. I didn't study engineering, but I will. You see the people that do not contradict God, and they do not go contrary to God, and God says this is what you do. I've never seen that done. I've never gone that direction. There are people that want to just live as usual. As it was yesterday, so it is today, and so it will ever be. And God calls them to a new challenge, and to a new move, and to a new ministry, and to a new engagement. But they are not used to doing anything new. It must be as it was yesterday, and as it was last year, as it was with my predecessors. That is what I do. But the people that will say yes to God, whatever the challenge, and whatever the calling, and whatever the difficulty on their way, those are the people that have the ability to walk with God in decisive work. I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. A new demand may come. A new challenge may come. A new calling may come. I have decided to follow Jesus. It's my decision. It's the decision of the heart. And so what he calls me for today or tomorrow, which I didn't know yesterday, I have decided. I didn't decide with other people. If they agree, then I follow. If they help, then I follow. If they encourage, then I follow. If they discourage, then what can I do? I'm a man, I'm a woman that has to depend upon other people. I don't like anybody frowning at me. I don't like anyone disagreeing with me. God is calling me to this and, you know, I say to that person, this is what I'm going to do and he says you are going to do that you are going that direction i say please don't be angry with me if you're angry because of that i drop it those people cannot have a decisive walk for a great practical faith but the people that say i know this is what god wants and this is what i will follow like noah these are the generations of noah noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and noah walked with god everybody was corrupt but he was different look at verse 22 there in verse 22 he says does did Noah according to all that God commanded him so did it. Do you have that record in heaven? Do I have that record in heaven that as God commanded him so did he. As God commanded her so did she. She did everything, whether people understand or not, whether this will affect my personality and my self-esteem. If I do this, I become a lone ranger. Nobody is thinking about this. I am the only one committed to this. What will they think of me? Uh -uh. What do they think of me? What does that matter? What do they think of you? What does that matter? What does God? What does heaven think of you? Because of that, he had this decisive walk with God. He had this practical faith. You can't, uh, you know, if you have a kind of impractical faith, you can't bring all the wood together, begin to knock and make that noise, and you're building an ark. And you say, no, why all this noise of, you know, the gigantic uh, ark you're building? He says, it's going to rain. And then I'm going to be inside that ark. And my sons and my, you know, daughters-in-law, they're going to be there. Noah said that again, it's going to rain. 
there had not been rain before that time, not to talk of flood before that time. And this person, this man that has his thinking and intelligence, not of himself, but coming from God. And he's not thinking like other people are thinking. That is the kind of faith, practical, purposeful, that the Lord wants us to have, and he wants us to live in that distinct, decisive way. We're looking at number three now. Number three, I'm looking at the dynamic work guided of guided purposeful faith you know uh, there are people that walk and it's like they're sleeping the people that talk it's like they're sleeping and you almost want to go and help them so that they don't fall down because they are standing there are people they preach the gospel. They proclaim the gospel. It's like they're doing everything they're doing and they are absent minded. But the kind of faith and the kind of a guided faith, purposeful faith, it wants us to have is the kind of faith that stands and that is active and that is alive and awake. The dynamic walk of guided purposeful faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8. It says in Hebrews 11 8, but by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed, look at this, and went out, look at this now, not knowing whither he went. Not knowing whither he went. You see the faith we're talking about? It's not the faith that, okay, God, tell me everything that will happen if I accept this calling. If I rise up and I want to do what you are asking me to do, tell me the year I begin. Tell me what will happen. I like to plan ahead. And five years after, tell me what will happen. Tell me, ten years after, tell me what will happen. That's why people run to people, to others, prophets who can see vision. Prophet, I want to get married. Ah, you are not married? No, not yet. You want to get married? Do you have anybody in mind? Let me give you the name. And pray and fast for me. And tell me what will happen 10 years after the marriage, five years after the marriage. They want to know all the details before they get started. I'm having a calling, a calling to the ministry, a calling to what the Lord wants to be the rest of my life and the things I do. But God, I see them. Call. I hear the call. I feel the call. But God, before I say yes and before I stand up and I go, can you tell me what will happen? How I will be fed? Because you know now I'm a professional man and I don't depend upon anybody and I make good money. Now tell me if I have this call. And I respond to this call, tell me what will happen. Now, you're doing, the Lord is calling to networking. And he says, you and you and you network together and carry this gospel to the great beyond. And then we ask the brother, how about it? He says, I'm still praying about it. What do you mean? Have you heard from God for that networking? Yes, I have. Are you sure it's God talking? Yes, I'm sure. What are you praying about? I want him to tell me what will happen years to come if I do this. You see, that is not a guided, profitable, 
and purposeful faith. We're talking about a dynamic walk. You hear his voice and you know that is God talking. What would you have done? My brother, my sister, when God said, Abraham, here am my Lord. Take that your son. God, which son? Because Ishmael is gone. And it remains only one. I mean, that son with you whom you love. Take him and I'll show you the mountain where you will sacrifice him unto me. God, but you said that this I seek will, be, will cause joy and laughter in my family. No. No argument, I don't understand. But you said, through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I don't understand. But God said, I know I had God. And I know God said, take that son, that son you love, sacrifice him to me. And Early in the morning, the following morning. He didn't know there'll be a replacement. He didn't know there'll be a substitute. He didn't know there'll be a ram there. And he didn't know it was a test of his faith because God did not say, Abraham, testing, testing, testing. No. He thought it was for real, but he had the faith that God cannot fail. That if I give the son to God, he'll give that son back to me. Before anybody was raised from the dead, Abraham believed in resurrection. That's why he said God cannot make a mistake and this is what God has said. He says by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive after receive for an inheritance. He obeyed. Obedience is what marks us as faithful People that are full of faith. See that word faithful? Faith, full, full of faith. It is the obedience in our lives that shows we have that dynamic faith of being guided and purposeful. He got, he took that child and he took the servants with him and he was going and he told those servants, he said, I and this lad, will go there and worship. What he meant by worship, I will offer not money, I'll offer my son unto God. And we, this boy, that I will give to the Lord, something will happen, myself and him will still come back. That's the faith we're talking about. And he got to the place. Before he got to the place, I seek already now, an observant, intelligent son. Daddy, here is wood, here is fire. The sacrifice you are going to burn, we can't see. And he says, son, don't think about that. God himself will provide the sacrifice. And he got there. And of course, I still believe that, that God will provide. They got there. When they got there, they arranged the wood. Abraham had the knife in his hand and he began I said, come here. And then he began to tie him to lay him on the wood. God and daddy must have something in heart. Whatever they have in heart, daddy told me that I will be the foundation of blessing of families to come. Whatever they have in mind, I know that promise cannot change. That's the faith. And then he searched out the, uh, the, the knife and God called him Abraham. Abraham. 
And he said, I'm always here for you. Here I am. Don't do anything to that child. He lifted up his eyes and God had provided the lamb. And yet, God could not say, uh-huh, you see, you are walking with me. How far can you walk with God? Because he obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the excelling work of fruitful exploits for God. Excelling, excelling something you've never seen happen before. But because you are walking by faith and because you are following by faith, those exploits are done. Look at verse 32 of Daniel chapter 11. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God, hold on. It looks like in this life, the wheat and the tears grow together. It looks like in this world, the good and the bad live together. It looks like in this world, the people who follow God and the people who follow Satan, it looks like their next door neighbors. In this life, the people that follow Christ and that follow the Antichrist, it looks like we're living close together. In this one verse, such as do wickedly against the covenant shall the Antichrist corrupt by flatteries. We see there's corruption here, yes. There's corruption there, Yes, and somebody came to you and said, if you can't beat them, join them. If you cannot be different and distinguished, join them. Those people who join them, they don't do experts in life. They don't come, they don't become different in life. While the people that do wickedly, and they corrupt themselves and the covenant by flatteries. It's at the same time there are people that do know their God and those ones shall be strong. You'll be strong in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, it's good to live uh, in a Christian country. And so everybody around you in the Christian country will be encouraging you, rise up and walk with God. It doesn't happen that way. Sometimes it's good to attend a Christian school, a Christian school where all the people in the school, all the students in the school, they believe that this is the thing to do. After all, we're a Christian school. And everybody, every student in the school is, uh, you know, counseling, advising, and encouraging, get up and run. It doesn't happen that way and sometimes you think we're in a seminary in a seminary everybody there ought to be people of faith and people of action and people of love in a seminary i'm sorry it doesn't happen that way anywhere you are a seminary or in the society a school or an institution it might have a christian name but you still have to have a distinct and an excelling kind of character. Well, I didn't go to a Christian school, what you call Christian school. My own principal at that time, forming our lives, it wasn't a Christian. He himself said so. He was an atheist. And all the other students, too, they took after him because, you know, he was a kind of hero figure to everyone in the school. But I said... I'm not going to follow that, and I'm not going to follow. And he knew, because eventually I became a teacher there, and I lived my life different. And he said, they called my name. Are you not going to come in tomorrow for this? And I said, no, I won't come. 
What are you going to do? Everybody is doing this at this time. I said, you know, I bought it in Christian. And I'm, they don't even know the meaning of Christian, not to talk of born again Christian. And you look at our, at our principal, he was a soldier in the Second World War. And he stood like a soldier, and he talked like a soldier. He looked at you like a soldier. What does that matter to me? The captain of our salvation is looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I don't care how any soldier of a militant atheist, how he looks. I have heard the word from on high, and I live by that word. That's what brought me here today. If I didn't have that different life, I would have collapsed long ago. If I didn't have that decision that whatever others do, whatever others do not do, here, I stand. If I didn't have that, we will not be meeting here today. But thank God we're meeting here today because something happened in the past and I pass that to you. You will stand. And you will do what God has called you to do because the people that do know their God will be strong and they will do expert. Quickly, three things. Number one, the evangelical work of a commissioned watchman. Number two, is the extensive work of a consecrated word messenger. Word messenger. You are a messenger, not to a denomination. You are a messenger, not to an organization. You are a messenger for the word. And you are a word messenger. Number three is the explicit work of a courageous workman. Look at number one is the evangelical work of a commissioned watchman. In Ezekiel chapter 3, reading from verse 17, Ezekiel chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 17. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. That's enough. That's enough. I have made thee a watchman. I, the Almighty, I, the planner from eternity, I, the one that inhabits eternity from the dateless past to the dateless future, I have made thee <clears throat> a watchman. And Ezekiel, Ezekiel might say, God, I don't feel like a watchman is not what you feel, it's what he has said. I have made thee, if I have made thee, all the things that go along, being a watchman, the courage, the fortitude, the passion, the zeal, and the ability, and the life of a watchman. If I have made you a watchman, I have created and given all that to you. I've made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. He actually decided for Ezekiel the lifestyle. He decided for Ezekiel the work he was to do. Hear the word, give them warning from me. And that is the full description of the man. Hear the word, hear the word. Ezekiel, this morning, have you gone to the Lord? Have you heard the word? Yes, sir. I have to do that every day. And what are you going to do with the word you have heard from me? I'm going to deliver to the whole nation. And I'm going to get every tribe to hear, every individual, every creature to hear. Because that's the calling he has given me here, the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, when I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, Ezekiel. Don't have that kind of gentleness. 
Lord, I cannot tell anybody. Thou shalt surely die. I am so tender in my heart. I'm so tender in my nature. How can I tell somebody, thou shalt surely die? What I've been telling them is God loves everybody. And God loves every sinner. And God loves everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what you are doing. Even if you are speaking on the face of God, God loves you. God is angry with the wicked, not with wickedness. Yes, he's angry against wickedness. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. How can God be angry with the sin and not be angry with the one that is producing the sin, propagating the sin, and projecting the sin? He hates the sin. He hates the sinner until the sinner repents. So, Ezekiel, don't have that kind of misplaced uh, understanding of love. He loves everyone unconditionally. Why would he allow them to go to hell and, and perish if he loved everyone unconditionally? And if he has already forgiven the sin of the past and the sin of the present and the sin of the future, you cannot tell all the things coming from seminaries of the world that they tell those sinners is giving you license for all your sins of the past, all your sins of the present, all your sins of the future. Uh, just raise up your hand and just do that. And once you raise up your hand like that, past, present, future, you have license now. Go and keep on committing sin. He has forgiven the sin before you committed it. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says, when I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wickedness and from his wicked way to save is life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. In verse 19, verse 19, yet if thou warn the wicked, and that and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, iniquity causes death. Death is separation, separation from God here on earth. And if the sinner dies, the sinner is separated from God all through eternity. He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Verse 20, in verse 20, and when... A righteous man doth turn from his righteousness. You know, I've been righteous. God, I've answered the register. And you've written my name. Righteous man, righteous woman. Yes, sir. Present, sir. And they have marked my name. After they've marked your name, as a righteous man, righteous woman, now, now you can go and do as you please. No, doesn't work that way. He gives us righteousness. It's a gift from God. But when he gives us, he wants us to keep that, <coughs> that righteousness. When a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity and I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die, righteous man. But he backslid, righteous man. He went back to sin, righteous man. He went back, she went back to swallow her old vomit. He shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood 
Will I require a chance? In verse 21, verse 21 tells us, Nevertheless, if thou want the righteous man. How do you want a righteous man? He said, and you told him, he saved forever. What do you want him? He saved his sins of the past forgiven. And you told him his sins of the present forgiven. And you've told him the sin he will still commit for the rest of his life. Even before he commits them, they're already forgiven. What warning do you give him? You see, you will contradict yourself. Since you've told him that all his sins of the past, of the present, of the future are already forgiven. Is saved and secured forever. Whatever he does, you have no warning for him anymore. But you know, God said, Ezekiel won that righteous man so that he does not go back to the sin of the past. Why? The just shall live by faith. But if any man, the one, who has been justified, if he draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's the whole Bible. Let's read the whole Bible and let's show the people this is what God has said and the Lord will bless your ministry. In that verse 21, it says, Nevertheless, if the one, the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he is one also that was delivered by. So let's look at number two here. Number two is the extensive work of a consecrated word messenger the extensive work of a consecrated a committed word messenger jeremiah chapter one i'm looking at verse seven but the lord said unto me say not i am a child you know there are things the lord does not want you to say there are things the lord does not want me to say what's that is factual is true jeremiah said i am a child true but god said don't say that there is something that is more true than the fact you have given i am a child i'm unintelligent true God says, don't say that, because the intelligence of heaven will be given unto you. I am inexperienced, true, but don't say that again, because the experience of Christ that lives in you will become yours. I am powerless. Maybe that's true, but don't say that again, because the power from on high will come upon you. There are people that indulge themselves in saying, what do you say? This is true, and this is even a fact coming from a humble man, a humble woman. I don't have his intelligence. It's true, but don't say that again. I don't have his constitution and his courage. It's true, but don't say that again. Learn from the Lord. The things you have been saying, the things you have been saying that bind you, the things you have been saying that tie you down, that you say, because I'm a child, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. If I examine your vocabulary, your speech, you might find I cannot is more in your life than I can. And the Lord is saying, turn that around and block off that I cannot and let I can. Replace it. I can. I can. I can do everything God says I can do. I can go everywhere God says I should go. And I can achieve everything God says I will achieve. But the Lord said unto me, 
Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go. Thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. And so, cancel that, I'm a child, cancel that, I cannot, and you go to all the places I send you. And then you say and speak everything I have commanded you. Look at verse 8, in verse 8, be not afraid of their faces. You see, when you say I'm a child, within that language I'm a child, comes fear. The child fears darkness. Mommy, are you still there? There is something under the bed that the fear of a child. Mommy, what's behind the window? I'm hearing some sound. Looks like they have come to take us. That the fear of a child. You see, when you have the mind of a child, the mentality of a child, the one that is filled with the fear of childhood, fear will come in. But now God said, don't say that again, that I'm a child. Be not afraid of their faces. You know what you do when you want to make your child fearful and keep quiet. A policeman is coming. A policeman is coming. And, and the child will hush the cry. A soldier is coming. And the child will hush the cry. And they have used that on us for ages. For a long time, that now as we go up into adulthood, a policeman is coming and you have not done anything wrong and it shakes your mind. A soldier is coming. They've shown us some things. Might be a colorful thing, might be whatever. And they've trained us from early childhood that any time you see this, you must exhibit fear. Anytime you see the face of a man, the face of a woman like this, they taught and trained us from childhood, you must have fear. And so now we're in the ministry. And something meaningless, and something purposeless, and something that doesn't have any weight as light as a feather. They show that to us, and we have fear. You know what? It's not the feather. It's not the look. It's not that thing they are showing. It's the training and conditioning they gave us from childhood that always brings that fear. But that fear is canceled today. Yeah. What will you do if you have no fear? How will you speak if you had no fear? How will you run if you had no fear? Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. Ah, ah. The one that is greater than the policeman you are fearing, I am with you. The one that is greater, mightier than the soldier that told you to fear from your childhood, I am with you. The one that is greater than that colorful thing, that feather that you have crunched, uh, crumbled under from your childhood, he said, I am greater than them. And he says, I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord, he will deliver you. He surrounds you. He goes before you. He comes behind you. He's on your right hand side. He's on the left. He's above. He's beneath. And you're secured in the ministry the Lord has called you to do in Jesus' name. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. And then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. They'll touch your mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And he said, That man, young 
and yet having the strength and the power of a person who has the presence and the power of God. And he sent him to nations, not just one nation, he sent him to nations. The Lord is sending you. You will do what he has said you will do. You will go where he said you will go. And you wake up in the morning, a new day, and the, the, the thing that comes to you when you wake up in the morning is when you think of what you are going to do in the day, when you are going to go in the day, fear will be the first resident uh, person um, that shows up. I'm saying, ah, you're still there. Yes, I'm resident here with you. We we'll drive those people, those residents out from our lives in Jesus' name. And now when you wake up, the first thing that shows up is the strength, is the power, is the authority, is the anointing that breaks every yoke. I'm saying, this is the day the Lord has made, and I'm going out, I am going to do exploits for the Lord today in Jesus' name. And whatever I say personally in my life, whatever I say in Jesus' name too, I know that thing is done. Of course, I cannot say in Jesus' name to a lie. I cannot say in Jesus' name to deception. I cannot say in Jesus' name to transgression. But when I talk of victory, and when I talk of triumph, when I talk of power, when I talk of ability to go out and achieve, and then I say, in Jesus' name, he puts me on the tower. And the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it into it. And he saved, and he is going to be an achiever. And I pass that to you in Jesus' name. Number, number three here, number three is the explicit work of a courageous workman. The explicit work of a courageous workman. I'm looking at Micah chapter 3. And I'm looking at verse 8. It says, but truly, but truly, it's like, you know, Micah rising up in the morning and then looks at his wife and he says, my wife, truly, and looks at the children. He says, children, your dad is going to do something today. But truly, and then looks at the neighbors and everybody around, and they were thinking, what will Micah do today? Will he go that way today? Will he say that today? Will he preach that word today? Will he pray for people today? Will he challenge people today? And while they were still wondering, he came out and said, but truly, and you know, in your life, find the things that are true. He lives in me, truly. He abides with me, truly. And he has not forsaken me, truly. He gives me power. And he gives me the foresight and the insight and the vision of an eagle, truly. And he makes me to know I'm a purposeful man. You're a purposeful woman. And then you put truly. And you confess that every time. Because it's what you confess, you will possess. It says, but truly, when somebody starts his response by the word, but the people before he opens his mouth, they have been saying something. They have been telling something. Then he comes in and he hears what they are saying and he sees what they are doing and he sees everything and then he starts a sentence with, but truly, I am full of power. Amen. 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 These people that went before us, what did they say? I am full of weakness. I'm full of timidity. I am full of anemia. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm full of confusion. You see, if they were like that, we'll not have the Bible we have. But when they have met God, and God had met them, in the New Testament, when they are in Christ, and Christ is in them, the confession they made 
is in reality what God had done. If he abides in me and I abide in you, if you reside in my word and my word is resident in you, you will ask whatever you want, it shall be done when you are full of heaven. When you are full of promises, when you are full of the power of God, when you are full of the presence of God, what have you to fear? Micah said, but truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of might, and to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel is sin. I pray the presence of God will fill us. Amen. The power of God will fill us. Look, look at my kind, the old covenant. Look at you in the new covenant. And look at you in a better covenant. And look at you with better promises and look at show what Christ doing a greater more powerful uh, performance in your life if he said that I am full you remember what Jesus said he said you have the spirit with you and it shall be in you and he will abide with you forever forever and the calling of God and the gifting of God is without repentance. What you had today, you still have. Uh, what you had yesterday, you still have today. I said, what you had yesterday, you still have today. I look at yesterday, and then I was called to stand up and say the word. And I looked at the courage I had yesterday. And I looked at the performance I had yesterday. And I looked at the victory I had yesterday. And I looked at the dynamic power of the spirit I had yesterday. Now today has come. And I'm called to come up and do the same thing. And if you feel weak, I ask myself, what's the matter with you? What you had yesterday, don't you have today? Answer me. I said, answer me. If I had courage yesterday, and it's by the Spirit, and he said that Spirit will never leave me, and his calling is without repentance. Why don't I just say, Lord, I thank you that yesterday was great. Today is going to be greater. Amen. Because you were full of power yesterday and nothing has changed. God has not changed. Christ has not changed. The promises of God are not, have not changed. And the power of the Spirit has not changed. If anything has changed, it's your own thinking about yourself that has changed some circumstances changed but you forgot god christ the word the promise the power none has changed what you had yesterday you still have today the victory you had yesterday you still have Today. And so you can come side by side with Micah and say, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. We'll come to point number three here. Point number three is the excellent way into the full exploits in God. The excellent way. In Hebrews chapter 8, reading there from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. 
by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. That's what we have in the new covenant, in the new testament. And that Jesus is for us. And it says in John chapter 14 verse 6, it says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The excellent way. Look at three things here. Number one, the highway through to full experience in God. When you are traveling on the highway, you have in the head, in the mind, the destination. And there is something, something you didn't get in the past in the previous destiny, uh, destination or place where you were, that's why you took the journey. And you are now on the highway, and you are going, and when you get there, you have something you never had before. That's why we come on the highway, so that we can get to full experience in God. Number two is the higher way up, to fuller exploits in God. If I'm not satisfied with the exploits of God, if I know, yes, many people have been helped, but multitudes are still waiting for further help. That's why I go on a higher way now up to fuller exploits in God. Number three is the heavenly way to the fullest expressions of God. Full experience, fuller exploits, and the fullest expressions of God. We're looking at number one, that's the highway through to full experience in God. In Isaiah chapter 35, reading here from verse 8, and an highway shall be there, and an highway shall be there. As I've read about Paul the Apostle, and I've read about Peter, and I've read about Martin Luther, I've read about John Wesley, I've read about Charles Finney. I've read about all these great men of God. And I'm asking myself, how do I get to that place? And highway shall be there. And highway. And it's open to everybody. You see, when he constructed that highway there, that expressway there, and it will move you from uh, this town to that city, they constructed the highway for everyone. And when God makes the highway, the highway that all those great men of God, all the highway they have gone through, the highway is there for everyone. And now in my generation, I can come to that highway, whether you are a man or a woman, they did look at the driver in, on the seat. Uh, you are a woman and you are of middle age, and you want to pass this highway, you say, yes, it's constructed for everybody. The same thing spiritual, this highway that gets us to a full experience in God is made for everyone because an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness, the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein, though fools. I hope you believe what I'm going to tell you now, because I went to a school where they didn't teach religious knowledge, where they didn't have Bible knowledge. Because I went to a school where they didn't have anything of Christian value. 
only to tell us you are the captain of your soul and you are the leader of your life. I didn't talk about God, about Christ, about grace, about salvation, and about Bible knowledge. I didn't know the difference between apostle and epistle. True. I didn't know anything at all. I didn't know which one comes first, Job or Esther. How could I know that? I didn't know what is the difference between the Revelation and the Romans. How could I know? And yet, though a fool, though a fool in religious matters, I heard the gospel and I said, that's good enough. This is what I've been looking for. I heard about grace. I heard about salvation. This is what I've been looking for. And I gave my life to the Lord. Simple. He called me. And I responded. And I said, Lord, here I am. And now I can tell you. Even though I was a fool at that time. In knowledge. In wisdom. In Christian ethics. In Christian teaching. In Bible teaching. A fool. And yet... I've come through that same highway. And what Wesley knew, I think I know a bit of that now. And what Martin Luther knew, I think I know a bit about that now. And the power of evangelization that John Finney had, I think I have a bit of that now. Why? The men we fear in men, though fools, shall not err therein. A new experience is waiting for you. A full experience is waiting for you. And whatever your ignorance of the past, you will come up. Dynamic life. Dynamic ministry. <laughs> you know, whenever they say that, because I knew where I was coming from, I used to say an amen that people would look around and say, who is that? Now, say an amen that somebody will look around and say, who is that? Yeah. We're coming to number two now. Number two is the higher way up to fuller exploits in God. Fuller exploits in God. You know, uh, since all these uh, many years, the Lord had given me experience in the Lord. Would you know that up till this morning, I'm still asking the Lord, because you know, heaven is fuller than how full you are. Heaven has more than what you have in you at present because we say there is more from where that came am i taking some water and i have a glass of water in my hand and i tell myself there is more from where this came am i having some joy am i having some victory and i look at the victory and i see there is more from where this came. Any experience we have, any exploits we have, there is more. And because of that, we're talking about fuller exploits in God. And the higher way takes us there. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. From faith to faith. There's little faith there's normal faith, there's greater faith, there's the grain of mustard faith, there's the gift of faith. And so we don't stop and say, I've got faith, something greater, something higher, from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just, the just also, they go from faith to faith. Why? Because the challenges of the just, when he was first justified, was at this level. And now persecution comes, and now difficulties come, and the just now has greater challenges. If he has greater challenges, he must have 
greater faith. You see, the faith will keep on growing and coming up as we have the challenges coming up. From faith to faith, John chapter 1 verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. And grace for grace. Paul the apostle, when he was just a believer, grace. And his grace was given to him because he had done all those things in unbelief. And now he became a, a man that was identified. And they saw him there at Damascus. They had to give him or lift him over the wall. And the grace to sustain that has to be great and grace, from grace to grace. And now he comes to the disciples and the apostles. And he said, So, come in here. No way, no chance. They closed the door against him before Barnabas came to tell them. He's one of us now. He preached Christ in Damascus. He had to have a greater grace to bear all the rejection of those apostles. And I went on the field and as he was preaching, Elimas the sorcerer withstood him and wanted to turn the deputy away from uh, the faith. The man we are talking about has to have a greater grace now so that nothing will beat him back and nothing will stop him. And he looked at that man and said, thou child of the devil, will you not stop? Preventing, hindering the way of the gospel. And while I am here and I'm talking to this deputy, I set blindness on you. You know, he just came to the level of Elisha. When those people came, who are you looking for? The man you're looking for is not here. And he said, Lord, blindfold them. And then he said, I'll take you where I need to take you to. You see, the grace has to be increasing in our lives. And now he became the master builder. And he said, by the grace of God, I have done what I am doing as a great master builder. And to labor, I labored more abundantly than they all. Grace has to increase in our lives. And there he, now he had thorn in the flesh. And the thing buffeted him and buffeted him. And he prayed once. And when he went to the next city, the persecutors were still waiting for him. The same persecution. And he prayed and prayed and prayed again. And then he went to the next city. And the people were waiting for him to cause confusion and send him away. And the grace was increasing. And eventually he got to that other place. They took up stones and began to stone him. And the people of God surrounded him after the stoning. Then he rose up and went to the next place preaching. Why? Because my grace is sufficient for you. We don't stay at the low level of grace and feel that because we have this grace, that's enough. The grace of yesterday and the grace of yesteryears, we go from grace to grace. And look at uh, Psalm 84, and I'm reading from verse 7. In Psalm 84, reading from verse 7, they go from strength to strength. They go from strength to strength. The possibility is there. The opportunity is there to have a greater strength today than we had yesterday. They tell us in the world, the higher you go, the cooler you become. The more anemic you become. And the weaker you become. But in the Christian fold, we go from strength to strength and we say, according to the word of God, they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appears before God. 
appearance before God. Before I go to appear before men, I appear before God. Before I go to appear in the public, I appear in the private before God. And he has strength and strength and strength. And because of that, I can go from strength to strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up and they will run and they will walk. They will not be weary and they will not faint. It says they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appears before God. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But we all, with open face, beholding as it were in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. He died for us so he can bring us to glory. And the glory is not static. The glory, the, the strength, the honor is not static from glory to glory. Even as by the spirit of the Lord. And whatever level of faith you are today, you are coming higher. Whatever level of strength you have today, you are getting higher. And whatever strength you have today, you are coming higher in Jesus' name. Amen. And glory, glory, glory will increase in your life, in your family, in your ministry, in the things you set your hand upon, the glory will increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Now point number three here. Number three is the heavenly way to the fullest expression of God. The heavenly way to the fullest expression we have in God. In Colossians chapter three, reading there from verse one. Colossians chapter three, Reading from verse 1, he says, Because we come to the presence of the Lord, and now we set our affections on things on high. If ye then be risen, since now you are risen with Christ, we died with him. Because we are crucified with him, we are buried with him in baptism, and now we rise with him, the same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, now dwells in us to quicken us and to raise us up. And because he does that, he revives and he makes alive every part of our body. And he said, we are crucified. We died, we're buried, now we're risen. And since now you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are born, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And it says in verse 2, it says, set your affection. Set your affection. You know, some people say, my mind runs away from me. My affection runs away from me. My purposefulness in life runs away from me. My vision runs away from me. My passion runs away from me. And I have absent mindedness. And when I kneel to pray, my mind goes here, my mind goes here, my mind goes everywhere. It's not stable. But you know what the Lord said? He said, set your affection like you set your alarm and you set that alarm whether on the clock or on the phone and you determine when that alarm will ring it says in the same way he has given us the possibility that our affection can be set can be focused on things above how because of the way I set my thoughts, how? The way I set my habits, how? The way I set my interest, 
how the way I said the non-negotiables in my life and I set it for that needful essential because of the way I set my gain and because of the way I set my spirit in selflessness set your affections on things above not on things on the earth. In verse 3, it says, For ye are dead, Lord, am I dead? Am I alive? It says, Because the old thoughts are dead. Because the old habits are dead. Because the old interests are dead. Because the old non-essentials that I wasted my life on, the, the, the old non-essentials are dead, and the old gains are dead, and the old self-centeredness dead, ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. You are now in Christ and Christ is in you. And then in verse, in verse 4, it says when Christ who is our life, Christ is now your life. My life. He never forgets Christ your life. He never frets Christ your life. He never fears Christ your life. Is never on any unprofitable journey or path, Christ your life. He sits now on the throne of your heart as the governor, as the leader, as the ruler. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. Where? Where? That's our destiny in glory. Look at me. Let me look at you. You are going there. Amen. Glory. Amen. Faith. Grace. Strength. Amen. Glory. Amen. All the wall of partition, all the hindrances between you and that final glory, the Almighty God takes away from your path. And you are now on your journey to glory. Amen. Every day, glory. Amen. Every event, glory. Amen. Every deliberation, glory. Amen. Every achievement, glory. Amen. In your heart, glory. Amen. On your way, glory. Amen. And after every evangelistic outreach, glory. You will go, you will not come back home, and then when you get back home, like Elijah, after bringing fire from heaven, the following day he heard that Jezebel is now going to take over in his life, and his life will end by the decision of Jezebel. And he looked away from faith to faith. He looked away from grace to grace. He looked away from strength to strength. He looked away from glory to glory. And then he was in the dungeon of despondency. Why am I alive? God, take my life. He will not take your life. While God was preparing chariots of angels and horses spiritual in heaven to come and take him, that he will not see death, he said, God, kill me by yourself. All your negative prayers, God will not answer. Amen. Greater than what you think and what you want, glory. Amen. I see it on your faces, glory. Amen. Why don't you stand up and say, glory. Why don't you stand up and say you are going from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from power to power, and you are going from glory to glory. Tell the Lord the days coming are better than the days that have gone. Tell the Lord the things you are going to have, the things you are going to feel, and the things you are going to possess, they are greater than what has gone in the past. It's coming 
and he will see you in glory he will see you in glory all the shame of the past is gone all the regrets of the past they are gone all the guilt of the past they are gone and all the failure of the past they are gone now from faith to faith now from grace to grace now from strength to strength now from glory to glory In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have what God says I have. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. There are things they said, say not. I am a child. Say not, I am weak. Say not, I cannot. Let the old language of failure and defeat be dead and buried. Amen. And a new personality rises up now to go from glory to glory. Amen. Where is he? Where is she? New, faith to faith. New, grace to grace. 
all the grace you will need any time, every time in your life, stretch out your hand, it's already given unto you. All the provision you will need, all the power you will need, all the courage you will need, any Goliath may stand before you. All the courage you need, they'll not bring you down, you'll bring them down. And then you go from strength to strength. It will strengthen your mind. It will strengthen your bone. It will strengthen your physique. It will strengthen your spiritual life. Strength to strength. You'll be stronger today than you were yesterday. You'll be stronger this year that you were stronger the previous year in Jesus' name. Amen. And now from glory to glory. Amen. What are you? Glory to glory. Amen. Only those who are blind will not see the glory on you. In fact, you know, when you close your eyes and it was dark and you turn on the light, without even opening your eyes, you can see there is light. Even the people that appear blind, they will see the glory of God upon your life. Amen. Glory on your ministry. Amen. Glory on your personality. Amen. Glory on your undertaking. Amen. And you go from glory to glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep up those hands. Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray for every brother, every sister, every minister, a man, every minister, a woman, every minister here, there, everywhere. We pray you lift up everyone to a higher level of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. As you told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Lord, I pray sufficient grace. Sustaining grace, Amen. securing steadfast grace, grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, their strength will not fail. Amen. As we wait upon you, you give us power, renewed power, renewed strength, renewed courage every time in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we look on Jesus, and behold Jesus and see the bright image of Jesus where he is now on the right hand of majesty. I pray glory will come to every life. Amen. Glory in our hearts. Amen. Joy in every heart. Amen. The excitement to live and the excitement to go on and do the productive profitable will of God that glory bring to every life in Jesus name and Lord as we go on day after day year after year increasing glory brighter glory greater glory higher glory upon every life in Jesus name and when that final day comes and the people of God here, there, everywhere will be laboring by the grace of God. When that final day comes that the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive shall be raised together with them and Christ will appear. My brother there, my sister there, my minister friend there, every one of us will appear in glory. Amen. And Lord, I pray that final fullest of all glories will be upon everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. And when we go in into the glories of heaven, the glories of grace on earth will bring, will keep on shining and shining forever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Between now and then, exploits, Amen. full exploits, Amen. fuller exploits, Amen. the fullest of exploits in every minister, 
everywhere in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. In Jesus' name, I pray. Another amen. amen. A glorious amen. amen. Right now. Right now. I don't feel like I used to feel. How about you? Things are different now. And things are going to be permanently different, higher, greater, mightier in your life in Jesus' name.